Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our Otter Talk today. Our speaker today is Michael Hartz, and he's going to talk to us about uh, dilation theory. Uh, take it away, Michael. Well, thanks, Meredith. Uh, thanks to all the organizers, uh, to the auto organizers for uh, having me, and, uh, and thanks to you for, for coming. Uh, so I gave a talk uh, or a series of talks at the Fields Institute last week about uh, the drury avison space and certain reproducing Colonel Hilbert spaces. And, uh, and those talks are, are online. So, so I figured uh, here I should talk about something that uh, doesn't have huge overlap with that. Uh, so there's a little overlap, but, uh, but not a lot. And so specifically what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is dilation theory, uh, which is a branch of, of operator theory. And uh, the basic idea behind dilation theory is actually uh, quite easy to explain. Uh, so the basic idea is uh, you start with some operator T, bounded linear operator on a Hilbert space, uh, which is supposed to be fairly general, whatever that means. Um, so typically this one is not so easy to understand, uh, but then you somehow associate with it um, a better understood operator N on, on a different Hilbert space, let's say K, and uh, usually you should think of, of, of K as being bigger than, uh, than, than H somehow. Uh, so this is supposed to be better behaved. And uh, the mileage you're supposed to get out of this is uh, if you want to prove a, a theorem about T, then um, you somehow translate this into a problem about N. Uh, N is supposed to be better behaved operator. So hopefully you can solve your problem for N. And then if this relationship was uh, you know, reasonably good, then uh, hopefully you can go back and say something about the original operator T. Uh, so you can think for instance, uh, as, as N being a normal operator where you have something like the spectral theorem and, and, and T being something pretty general. So the, uh, the most famous example of, of a theorem that allows you to do this is, is the Nag dilation theorem. Uh, so it says the following, so theorem to Nag. And it's about contractions on Hilbert space, so about operators that have a norm at most one. So suppose you have a T and B of H and it has norm less than or equal to one. And then this, uh, this theorem says that you can uh, choose your operator N here to be a unitary operator. Uh, so more precisely, it says that there exists, uh, well, so there exists two things, a larger Hilbert space K that contains H as a subspace and uh, a unitary U uh, on K. So this will be a unitary, that's the, the key point, such that you can recover T from U in some way. And so what does this mean to recover T from U? Um, okay, if you are, so you want T should be something related to U. Now U is an, is an operator on this bigger Hilbert space. Uh, certainly I can, I can feed it vectors from H, uh, that makes sense. Uh, but then I might not land back into H, uh, but there's a way to fix it. Namely, I just put the orthogonal projection onto H in front. And, and this alone would already be quite interesting, but actually I'm not sure that you can do much better uh, you cannot just do this for t, but simultaneously for all polynomials p of t. So this is, you can do this for all polynomials p uh, in one single variable. So in particular, you can do it for, for the powers, which is, which is equivalent. All right, so you can see in this setting, the, uh, the fairly general operator is just uh, uh, this, this operator t, which has norm at most one, right? Every bounded linear operator is, is of this type up to scaling. And uh, the better behaved operator is this operator U, uh, which is then a unitary, and this mysterious re uh, relationship between the two of them is exactly this thing. Um, now there's also a sort of a picture way uh, to think about this, uh, which uh, is you can write this, uh, this unitary dilation U. So this U is then called a dilation because the idea is you somehow make your space bigger and you move things around in, the, in this bigger space, but you can still recover T somehow. So you can, you can write this, uh, this operator uh, U as a three by three matrix, uh, operator matrix. And uh, so it's going to be lower triangular. You have something here, which uh, doesn't really concern us all that much. And then you have uh, zeros here, and then you have T uh, in the middle. And, and then this, this is an observation of Saracen's uh, that this is actually uh, equivalent to uh, this relationship here. So you, uh, the point, I'm, uh, the, the reason why I'm writing this down is, uh, uh, you, this really shows that T is in some sense a piece of, of, of U, right? You can recover it in, uh, in this matrix structure. Okay, so, so what can you do with this then? How can you um, 
uh, how can you prove theorems about T by, by reducing them to U? Well, the uh, sort of the, uh, the, 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 the picture book application is, is, is phenomenon inequality. And uh, so let me show you how this works. Uh, so, so von Neumann proved this inequality before Nag actually showed his, his dilation theorem and he proved it using different methods, using function theory essentially, uh, but it follows from this Nag theorem. So what it says is that if you have same setup, so you have an operator T on, on H, norm at most one, uh, and then you want, you're interested in how big does the norm of uh, P of T get when you, when you plug in T. And uh, the statement is that the norm of P of T is at most uh, the soup norm of the polynomial P uh, uh, on, on the unit disk. So we take the soup of all mod P of Z where Z has a uh, norm at most one. So this gives a, gives a very strong relationship between operator theory on, on Hilbert space and, and function theory on, on the unit disk, uh, which has been um, used very successfully. And so uh, the way this, this works is you just apply NAG, right? So, so if you apply this uh, NAG dilation theorem, then uh, you get this unitary dilation U, and then you, you notice that the norm of P of T is uh, at most the norm of P of U, uh, because if you have this relationship up here, this one, then if you leave out the projection, you leave out the restriction, the norm can only go up. Uh, but now the, uh, the thing you gained is that U is a normal operator. Uh, so by spectral theory, uh, you can say that this is the same as, as the soup uh, of the polynomial on the spectrum, where Z is in the, in the spectrum of U. So this is that it's normal operator. And because U is unitary, the spectrum is contained in the unit circle. Uh, so certainly this is at most. Uh, the soup norm of the polynomial uh, on, on the disk, right? Uh, and that does it. So the reason why I showed you this is it, it, it really uh, illustrates this uh, uh, heuristic that I, that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, right? You have a problem about T. T in general is, is sort of hard to understand. It's just a contraction, uh, but then you reduce it to a problem about U. U is easier to understand because you have spectral theory, you have continuous functional calculus or spectral theorem, whatever you like. And uh, if the relationship is good enough, which in this case it is, uh, you can uh, go back and say something about uh, your operator T. Let's see, uh, that, 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 that's how the game works. Okay, so, so that's it. Um, now in this, uh, in this dilation theory business, uh, there's always a, a bit of a tension uh, between how good your dilation is, or how good this operator N is, and uh, how tight the relationship between the two operators is, right? I mean, the, the better behaved your, your operator will be, the looser the relationship between uh, the original operator and the dilation is, is going to be. And, and let me illustrate this, uh, this principle uh, by, by mentioning a, a second version of this, uh, of this NAG dilation theorem. Uh, so this is again, so, so this is NAG again, oops. And, uh, so now second version. So we have the same setup. We have, a, a, again, an operator on, on Hilbert space that has norm at most one. So again, a contraction. Uh, but, uh, but now what we can do is uh, we can uh, tighten the relationship between T and the dilation, but then we get a slightly worse operator in, in the dilation. And, and what we get is an isometry. Uh, so you get, a, again, a larger Hilbert space so then there exists a larger Hilbert space K containing H and uh, an isometry, let's call it V. So this is just an isometry, not a unitary anymore. But uh, now the relationship becomes tighter and namely what you get is you can uh, arrange that H is actually invariant under V star. So V star H is contained in H and um, you can get that, uh, you can recover T star as a V star restricted to H. Um, so in this case, you don't need the orthogonal projection. You can just look at restriction because uh, the original space is invariant, uh, but the price you pay is that uh, you only get an isometry. Uh, you don't get a unitary. And so, so, so if you have this, this, this also implies uh, uh, the same result for, for polynomials just by, by invariance. So P of T star is equal to P of, V star restricted to H for all polynomials. 
In this case, you don't have to demand it for all polynomials, but you can if you want to compare it to this first version. Um, now, it turns out that, that, uh, that these two versions are, are more or less equivalent. Um, for instance, uh, going, going from the second version to the first version uh, is essentially amounts to understanding these isometries. Uh, so you have to, uh, if you know the Wolde decomposition, which says that an arbitrary isometry, it looks like a unitary direct sum, a bunch of unilateral shifts, uh, then you can easily prove the first version from the second one, because what you can do is you can take the unilateral shift and just extend it to a bilateral shift. And then you turned your isometry into a unit. Right? And, and, and so again, there, there's some kind of picture version here, which is that whoops, uh, V is, uh, looks like T zero, and then something that doesn't really concern us. Uh, so, so you can see that uh, the matrix got smaller, right? And uh, so, so this is, I mean, this is equivalent to saying that V star looks like T star zero and something. So the fact that you have a, a zero down here is, is equivalent to saying that you have uh, invariance of, of the Hilbert space H. And the fact that you recover T star in the one one entry is the same as saying that V star restricted to H is, is T star, right? So um, personally, I find these, uh, these little matrices a uh, useful way to think about it. Now, sometimes, uh, people sort of treat these, these dilation theorems almost like, like black magic. And uh, they, uh, you know, sometimes you sort of hear people say, well, where does this dilation come from? And this is uh, sort of almost too good to be true. Um, I, I would like to, to, to show you that constructing this dilation is actually not all that difficult. And uh, so I want to give you a, a rough idea of uh, how to construct this isometry V. So constructing the isometry V is slightly easier than constructing the unitary. So let me just do the isometry. And um, try to give you an idea that this is actually not all that uh, all that crazy. Uh, so, so, so here's the the idea of the construction. Um, uh, so, how does this uh, this work? Well, if uh, if V is supposed to look like like this, then we can just make a, make an attempt, right? So, so here's an attempt at this. going to define V to be, well, okay, we, we don't really have all that, much, all that many choices, right? We have T up here, we have zero here, and uh, let's call this guy A, and uh, okay, this guy I'm not going to touch for now. And, and so what's A going to be? That, that's the question. Well, we want that V is an isometry, uh, and if you compute V star V, and if you think about it, well, V star is just the, the conjugate transpose essentially of this matrix. So in the, in the one one entry, uh, V star is going to look like T star T plus A star A. Um, and then we have some other stuff that I'm not going to worry about. And so V star V is supposed to be the identity, right? Because V is supposed to be an isometry. Uh, so what we need clearly is that T star T plus A star A is equal to the identity. Right. If this scheme is supposed to work, then this has to be satisfied. Now, there's, there are many ways to achieve this, but there's one simple one. So I'm going to define, so the attempt is now over. Now we're going to define things. So if we define A to be identity minus T star T square root, then well, A is self-adjoint. And if you look at T star T plus A star A, then you get T star T plus identity minus T star T. So you get the identity, right? So, so then this equation above is, is satisfied. Okay. And, and notice this makes sense, right? Because T is a contraction. So T star T uh, is less than or equal to one. Okay. So then we're going also going to define our operator T to be T A zero. And then the question is, what are we going to put in here? Right. That's the question. Well, again, V is supposed to be an isometry. So this means that the range of the second column needs to be orthogonal to the range of the first column and uh, the second column is supposed to be an isometry. Now you can work, you can try to work hard, but the easiest way to do it is to just push away your problem and uh, say, okay, we're going to add another sum and, oops, we're going to add another sum and then just put the identity here and then a zero here. And then certainly the range of the first column and the range of the second column are orthogonal and this, the second column is an isometry. 
Okay, but the price we pay is that now we, we live on h direct sum h direct sum h. So then we have to do something with the third column, right? So now there is, is a third column in this matrix. Well, you can do the same trick. You just push your problem away again. So you say zero, zero, zero identity, and then you put zeros here. And then you have to put some, something in the fourth column, but I, I think I see now what you have to do. You just keep pushing away your problem. And uh, in the, in the, uh, if, if you push it away to infinity, then, then you're done, right? So, so, so this is the, um, the definition now. So you just keep going like this. And uh, then this lives on an infinite direct sum of, of copies of H. And that's it. That's the whole construction, right? You can recover it. So, so, so the way you should now read the two by two structure is like this. And uh, so this is an isometry and uh, it has this two by two structure with, with a zero up here and it has T in the one one entry. And, and that's the whole construction. So the point here is that it's not all that crazy, right? You, you, can, you can actually write it down fairly explicitly. And uh, what you can see though, is that if you start with something on a finite dimensional Hilbert space, then this construction will produce an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, right? Because you have uh, infinitely many copies of this. And uh, there's a ways around this, but, but, but I'm not gonna get into this. Um, okay, now this, this uh, um, theory of unitary dilations of, of contractions um, turned out to be extremely useful. Uh, so there's the, something called the nag foyash model theory, uh, which develops much of what you've seen in linear algebra um, to certain contraction operators. So they have uh, an analog of the characteristic polynomial. They have an analog of the minimal polynomial. For certain operators, there's some kind of Jordan canonical form and, uh, and all kinds of things. So because this was so, so successful, you can say, well, can we do this on domains other than the disk, right? This is all contained, connected to the disk somehow. And uh, so, so this leads to this notion of, of spectral sets. Uh, so suppose you have some compact subset X of the plane. And uh, then you want to look at operators that are somehow associated with X. So let's say the spectrum is contained in, in X. And then you want to look at something like unitary dilation, but it should be adapted to your, um, to your underlying set X. And uh, the notion uh, here is that you say a normal boundary of X dilation is a normal operator on a bigger Hilbert space. And you want two things. You want that the spectrum of the normal operator is contained in the boundary of your domain. And the second thing is you should, you should be able to recover T from this normal dilation. And uh, so you want that F of T is the projection of F of N onto H restricted to H. But um, in the case of the disk, we just demanded this for polynomials. And now it turns out it's actually natural to demand this for rational functions. Uh, because the point is that this, this set K, it could have holes, right? So, so K could like this, for instance, that'd be an okay K. And um, you want to be able to take poles in these, uh, in, in, in these two holes of, of the set K. Uh, if you have the disk, then it doesn't make a difference because you can approximate rational functions by, by polynomials on the disk. But uh, in general, uh, you want to allow rational functions uh, on, on X, right? So these are rational functions that don't have any poles on X. Uh, and then the question is, well, which operators have a normal boundary of X dilation, right? So question, so which T admit a normal boundary of X dilation, right? If, if X is the disk, then um, this is really unitary dilation because if X is the disk, then the boundary is the unit circle and so a normal operator whose spectrum is contained in the unit circle is, is just a unitary. So, so this is supposed to uh, be an adaptation of a unitary dilation to this set X. Now, if you remember this proof of Fonemann's inequality I gave you at the beginning, uh, you can see that there is a necessary condition for T to admit a normal boundary of X dilation, namely the analog of Fonemann's inequality has to hold. Right? So you can, you can do the same uh, argument I, I did at the beginning. And what you get is that the norm of f of t uh, has to be at most uh, the supernorm of this function f on this set x, right? So the sup of all mod f of z, sorry, z, uh, z and x. Um, just by, so, so this, this, this has to be true for all rational functions uh, on, on x, uh, just by, by the same argument as we had in von Neumann's inequality. And, and this has a name, uh, this is, 
So, so this is said that X is a spectral set for T. So this is the definition of a spectral set um, that the, uh, if, you, if you take your operator, you plug it into a rational function, then the, the norm of that is at most the supernorm of the rational function uh, on this set X. So for Neumann's inequality, it says that if you have a contraction, then the unit disk is a spectral set. Right? And, and actually, this is how von Neumann even stated his inequality. This notion of spectral set uh, is, is due to von Neumann. And, uh, and then the, the, the obvious question is, is this sufficient, right? Uh, so sufficient. So if, if X is a spectral set, does it have a normal boundary of X dilation? Turns out this question is hard. Uh, the answer is known, but it took uh, many decades until it became known. And uh, I want to mention some, some of the, uh, the sort of key insights that, that went into this, uh, because one of the key insights was that there is sort of an abstract version of formulating this problem, which uh, turned out to be very useful also for different purposes. So that's, that's the motivation for this abstract point of view, but you can also get to it using from, from, from different considerations. Right? So the abstract point of view uh, is the following. So what you can do is you can equip this, uh, this space of rational functions with a soup norm. So equip the rational functions with a soup norm. Right, so then it's a norm space. We're trying to get a functional analytic version of, uh, of this problem now. And uh, then, so, so where does the, uh, the boundary of X come into play? Well. Uh, you can think of uh, the rational functions on X uh, as sitting inside of the space of all continuous functions on the boundary of X just by restricting uh, to the boundary. And the reason why you can think of this as an inclusion is exactly the maximum Rogers principle from uh, complex analysis. Right? So this, right? in, in other words, principle. So in other words, the, the restriction map from um, the rational functions onto the boundary is a, an isometry, right? If you have uh, a rational function, then it's in particular holomorphic, so it attains its maximum on the boundary. Um, now you can also define another map, which is uh, associated with, uh, with this procedure here. So we're going to define uh, rho sub t to be the map that goes from rational functions on x uh, into b of h. And what it does is it takes a rational function f and just plugs in the operator. Oops. Just plugs in f of t. And uh, so what does is, what is spectral set then mean? Well, spectral set just means that this function rho t or this operator has norm at most one, right? It should decrease the norms. That's exactly uh, what the definition of spectral sets. Mean. So, so, rho, so x is a spectral set. if and only if rho t uh, has norm at most one. Okay, now how do you encode the normal boundary of extalation in this, uh, in this function analytic uh, perspective? Well, this has to do with uh, maps on these continuous functions on the boundary. Because normal operators whose spectrum is contained in the boundary are nothing else than star homomorphisms from continuous functions on the boundary into some B of K. Uh, so the observation is that X has a normal boundary of X dilation, uh, sorry, T has a normal boundary of X dilation, uh, boundary of X dilation. Uh, if and only if there exists this star homomorphism uh, star homomorphism pi from continuous functions into some B of K such that, well, pi is a dilation of rho, so that rho T of F is equal to pH pi of F restricted to H for all rational functions F. So why is this the case? Well, if you think about it for a second, if you have a star homomorphism from pi into B of K, then pi of Z is going to be a normal operator whose spectrum is contained in the boundary. And conversely, if you have a normal operator whose spectrum is contained in the boundary, then you have the continuous functional calculus 
which is then the star homomorphism. So this is just a really fancy way of, of rephrasing the fact that you have a normal operator whose, bound, whose spectrum is contained in the boundary. So the question then becomes, you have such a contractive map defined on the subspace or even subalgebra rational functions, does it dilate to a star homomorphism uh, on this uh, surrounding uh, continuous functions on the, uh, on the boundary? And so there's a, a, a very general setting you can look at, which is the following then. So the general setting uh, you can look at is, is this. So you have a B, a B, a unital C star algebra. So in our example, B is just continuous functions on the, on the boundary. So in our example, it's a commutative C-star algebra, but you can take a, a non-commutative one if you like. And, uh, and A is a unital sub-algebra. Doesn't have to be self-adjoint, just a sub-algebra. And so in our example, you can take A to be the rational functions uh, on X. And then we have this map row T, which is, uh, so it's linear, but it's also homomorphism. Uh, so a row T from A into some B of H uh, is a unital homomorphism. And so the question about the spectral sets can be rephrased as asking, if you have such a unital homomorphism, which is defined on a subalgebra, does it dilate to a star homomorphism on this rounding C star algebra, where dilation is exactly and this relation, which is above here. Now, there is a recurring phenomenon in several branches of functional analysis, which is that uh, if it makes sense to plug your objects into matrices, uh, then you should do so. And if you look at properties that hold at every matrix level, then you get uh, uh, often uh, very strong properties. Uh, so you've seen talks about non-commutative function theory, which is all about plugging a thing, you know, looking at, at the matrix level, and you can do similar things here. So the, the, the key observation is that you can define, uh, so these are sometimes called ampliations of, of your map row, which just act on matrices. And, and you really do the, the most naive thing you could do, you, you just apply this row entry-wise. So this goes from MN into B of H, and it just uh, takes a matrix AIJ and just applies row to each entry. There's nothing fancy about it. You just Take your matrix, apply your map to each entry, then you get another homomorphism. But the point is that MN of B of H is, uh, whoops, is, is again a, um, has a norm because you can identify N by N matrices with operators on H with operators on H to the N, just by the usual matrix vector multiplication. And uh, there's also a norm on, on, on MN of A, which comes from viewing it as a subalgebra of this MN of B. Uh, and uh, then the key insight is to define a uh, row to be completely contractive. If not just row has norm at most one, but all these ampliations have norm at most one as well. So if uh, the norm of row upper n is less than or equal to one, but now for all n. So you don't just demand contractivity at level one, but you do it at every matrix level. And then there is a, a, an abstract theorem that uh, sort of blows this problem out of the water, well, at least part of it, uh, which says that uh, a, completely a map is completely contracted if and only if it dilates to a star homomorphism. So, so let me make this precise. So this is a combination of theorems of Arvison uh, and Steinspring. And so, so I should say that this abstract point of view is really due to Arvison. Uh, so, and then he was actually interested in these spectral sets questions. So um, it goes like this. So suppose you have a unital homomorphism rho on some subalgebra of a C star algebra, uh, be a unital homomorphism and um, then the following equivalent Uh, one is rho is completely contractive, uh, so completely 
contractive, and two is what we want, rho has a dilation to a star homomorphism. So uh, there exists some map pi from the C star algebra B into B of K uh, such as so a star homomorphism. Oops. A star homomorphism. Such that you can recover rho from pi in the usual way. So such that rho of a is equal to pH pi of a restricted to h. And this is supposed to be true for all a and a. So this works in, in great generality, right? It's, it's not just for rational functions and, uh, and uh, spectral sets, but it works for any subalgebra of a C-star algebra. And, uh, and this turned out to be very influential. Uh, but one thing it does uh, is that it gives us an answer of which operators have a normal boundary of extalation. Because what you get is that uh, you should not just demand that um, rho is a, uh, that th this map rho t is uh, contractive, which is the same as saying it's kx as a spectral set, you should demand that it's completely contractive. And so, so, so this is the corollary you get. So T has a normal boundary of extalation. Uh, if and only if uh, X is a complete spectral set. So you don't just look at level one, but you look at higher levels. So, so this means that this map that we looked at rho T from the rational functions uh, into a, a B of H is uh, completely contractive, not just contractive. So in other words, you have to check this one on inequality, not just for rational functions, but for matrices whose entries are rational functions. And uh, then you get this, this dilation from this very general uh, arvison stein spring dilation theorem. Okay, um, now what does this say about our original problem? Right? The original problem was, is if, if, if X is a spectral set, does it have a normal boundary of X dilation? Well, then this question becomes, so does a spectral set imply complete spectral set, right? And uh, so sometimes it does. Uh, so, so, so for instance, uh, there's a, a deep theorem of Jim Agler, which says that uh, this is true if, uh, if, if X is an annulus. So it just has one hole essentially. So that's a theorem of Agler. Uh, but in general, it's, uh, it's false. So, so the answer is, is no if, if X has, has two holes, for instance. So it really depends on the, on the topology of, of the set X. Uh, if you have too many holes, uh, then this is no longer true. Then you really have to check things at the matrix level. If you have zero or one holes, then um, uh, it works by this, by this theorem of that. So the, uh, there were different people that came up with counter examples, but there's a one by Agler, Holland, and, and Raphael. And there's another one by, uh, Ritual and McCollum. So the, uh, this, uh, this is Agla, Holland, Raphael account example is actually found uh, on a computer. And uh, so they actually uh, really checked with the computer if this map is completely contractive. Well, not completely, but they checked if it's contractive at level two or three or something like this. And then uh, if you find a count example at level three, then you know it doesn't have a dilation, right? So, so that's another, a great insight of this uh, uh, reformulation, uh, at least at low levels, this is something you can conceivably check numerically, whereas existence of a dilation, okay, how would you go about and check this numerically? Okay, so, so this, this was one um, application of these abstract ideas to a, a pretty concrete problem in, in operator theory, namely these normal boundary of X dilations. And let me mention a, a second application of, of these ideas. Um, which was uh, to a, a question of, uh, of Halmos. Um, so the original question was, uh, which operators 
are, are similar to contractions. Uh, so uh, suppose you have an operator T and B of H, uh, and the question is, uh, when does there exist some similarity, so some uh, invertible operator S, Uh, such that S in, S T S inverse is a contraction. So let's say this has normal most one. And uh, so there were several reasons why, why people cared about this, but uh, one sort of uh, pretty obvious one is that these contractions, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they have this, uh, this nice knock foyash model theory associated with them. And so if you're similar to a contraction, then maybe you're not a contraction, but uh, then you can still leverage this, uh, this theory. And so how do you tell if an operator is similar to a contraction? Um, well, there isn't an easy necessary condition you can see. Uh, and uh, this, this easy necessary condition is uh, that uh, this operator T is what's called a power bounded. So to see this, so we'll, let's give this operator name. So S T S inverse. And so if this has norm at most one, then you can write T to the N. Well, let's see. So, so C is S T S inverse, so T is going to be S inverse uh, C S, and then if you take powers, then the, the similarity in the middle goes away, right? So this becomes S inverse C to the N S. And so then you can take norms. Uh, and then because if, if C is a contraction, then this is uh, at most the norm of S inverse times the norm of S. And so, so this property is, is, is called power boundedness because the, the powers of T to the N have to be bounded, right? They cannot go to infinity, the norms. So this is called power bounded. And, and these operators also appear in the study of uh, what are called C0 semigroups. So they have some uh, intrinsic uh, motivation as well. Okay, so then the question was, okay, is every power bounded operator similar to a contraction? And uh, didn't take very long, but the, the answer turns out to be no. So, so Foguel uh, gave an example uh, that shows that power bounded does not imply similar to a contraction. So it doesn't apply uh, similar to contraction. So, so then you need the better uh, necessary condition. Um, but it's in some sense, we know a better one because we know von Neumann's inequality. And uh, so instead of just doing this for powers, you can do it for arbitrary polynomials. So, so you can do the, uh, so, so there's a second necessary condition. Uh, necessary condition. Which is you, you do the, 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 uh, the computation above, but now for all polynomials, right? So then you get the, the norm of P of T so P of T is S inverse P of C S. Uh, and then you do the same thing. You say, uh, this is the most uh, norm of S inverse times the norm of S, but then you apply von Neumann's inequality. And you say that because C is a contraction, this is at most the supernorm of the polynomial on the disk. Right? And uh, so operators with this property, so that the norm of P of T is at most some constant times the supernorm on the disk, uh, they get a name they're called polynomially bounded. These are polynomially bounded operators. And uh, in this version, the question actually survived for a long time. So this was a, this became a famous question of, of Halmos. Um, so Halmos had a paper, 10 problems in Hilbert space. This was one of them. And it says that, is, so it asks, is every polynomially bounded operator similar to a contraction? So polynomially bounded operator similar to a contraction. And uh, this turns out to be much, much harder than this, uh, this, this, uh, this power bounded question. Uh, but the point I want to make here is that this abstract point of view using the sub algebras of C star algebras, uh, this again gives uh, uh, a very good, a useful insight into this. And uh, the idea is that what does it really mean to be polynomially bounded? Well, poly so, so, so T is polynomially bounded
if and only if this map rho t that we looked at earlier, which goes from polynomials, let's say equipped with a soup norm um, into B of H, right? So it takes a polynomial and maps it to P of T, if and only if this is a bounded map, that's just a reformulation. So this is bounded, okay? And uh, so the trick is, right, you shouldn't just look at level one, you should look at what happens at higher levels. That's the whole, uh, that's the whole moral of the story here. So you can look at, at what happens at higher levels, and then this uh, gives you a definition of what's called completely polynomially bounded. So we're going to define, so T is completely polynomially bounded. if uh, this map rho t is not just bounded, but it's uniformly bounded at every level. So if uh, the soup over all of these norms of rho t, if we look at the ampliations, if this is finite, right? So there's some constant so that uh, this uh, norm is at most a constant for every level n. So, or a different way to say this is that there's, there's one constant here so that for every matrix polynomial, when you plug it in, and when you plug t in, you get that the norm is at most a constant times the norm of the matrix polynomial. And uh, then you get a positive result. And this is a, this is a, a, a theorem due to Paulson, uh, which turned out to be the, the crucial insight here. Um, so this theorem due to Paulson says that T is similar to a contraction if and only if it's completely polynomially bound. So the, the story is very similar to this with spectral sets, right? There was, uh, you have a normal dilation if and only if you have a complete spectral set. And here you have similarity to contraction if and only if you're completely polynomially bounded. So T is similar to a contraction if and only if T is completely polynomially bounded. And in fact, Paulson proved an abstract theorem again, so I'm not stating it here, but uh, there is an abstract theorem that is very much in the spirit of this Aris and sign spring dilation theorem. And this is really just the corollary of this abstract theorem. So this is a second case where this abstract point of view with representations of operator algebras uh, helped uh, answer a pretty concrete questions about operators on Hilbert space. And, uh, so let me just mention, I mean, the story is not, it's not, it's not completely done yet, right? Because now the question is, is, is every polynomially bounded operator completely polynomially bounded? And uh, the answer to this is no, this is a theorem of, of, of PZA. Uh, so there is it, so there exists an operator, uh, uh, an operator which is uh, polynomially bounded, but not completely polynomially bounded. So I polynomially, oops. bounded operator uh, that is not completely polynomially bounded. So then therefore not similar to a contraction by Paulson theorem. It's not completely polynomially bounded. And again, this, uh, this uh, insight of, of, uh, of Paulson that you should look at the matrix level is it uh, turns out to be crucial. So if I remember correctly, in, 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 in PZA's proof, you check that it's not uh, polynomially bounded um, by, um, ah, no, I, yeah, sorry. I'm, uh, what I was gonna say isn't, isn't quite true, but uh, in, in, in this proof of, of PZA's theorem, uh, you have to come up with uh, some sequence of matrix polynomials where uh, the, uh, this, this norm here goes to infinity. So, uh, Right. I mean, how do you check that you're not similar to contraction, right? This is something that's very difficult to show, but uh, this is something that, uh, that the soup is, is infinite, is something that you can actually conceivably check. And this is exactly how uh, this uh, proof of PZA theorem works. Okay, so this is all sort of very classical uh, theory, but I think it, it, these are the first instances where it became clear that this abstract point of view uh, is useful even for concrete problems in operator theory. And uh, so let me just finish by, by saying that there are some, some more modern uh, directions that uh, people have, have taken this into. 
And uh, so I just want to mention two. Um, uh, so, 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 so two modern directions. Uh, the first one is uh, you can do multivariable operator theory. Uh, so you can try to do a lot of this, not in, in uh, for one operator, but for several operators. Um, and there are, there are quite a few new phenomena that arise. Um, and you can do this commutative or non-commutative, um, either works and, and either will, and, and you know, both uh, uh, lead to, uh, to a nice theory. And uh, there's another application, which is uh, on the face of it, in my opinion, very surprising, but it turns out to be uh, very fruitful. And this is a matrix convexity. Um, so uh, roughly speaking, if you think of non-commutative uh, function theory as a non-commutative version of complex analysis, then matrix convexity is a non-commutative version of, of convex analysis. And uh, it turns out that uh, these dilation theory ideas are closely related uh, to uh, certain notions in this matrix convexity business, for instance, to notions of extreme points. Um, so if you want to know more about this, I see him in the audience, you should talk to Eric. Uh, he's the expert on this, uh, but, 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 but this is one, uh, one direction you can, uh, you can take this into. Uh, so uh, that's essentially the end. Let me just uh, mention briefly, if, you, uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, where, where can you learn more? Um, so let me uh, recommend uh, one book by, by Vern Paulson, so it's the person who proved this stuff about complete polynomial boundedness. And so he has a book completely about the maps and operator algebras, where you can learn a lot about this. And uh, for this general dilation theory uh, uh, topic, uh, there's also a very nice survey by, by Orshalit Dilation Theory, a, a guided tour. And so I also recommend that uh, if, you're, if you're interested in this stuff. All right, that's it. Thanks.